Um, so I'm at Google. We used to be called Google Research. We've been rebranded Google AI. Um, and I'm part of the machine perception group. And I'm, I'm running a team called Veil, um, which I created a couple of years ago. Um, and that stands for vision, uh, action, and learning. And so a lot of the work we do is machine, uh, machine learning for computer vision problems. And you'll see that as a theme. Um, so specifically, I'm going to talk about three um, projects, very recent projects. Um, one is going to be about learning the network structure of a CNN. This is a submission to ECCB. Um, one of them is about uh, semi-supervised learning, so it's a joint probabilistic model of images and text. Um, so that was, as promised, about images and text. That's an iClear um, paper this year. And then another one is on self-supervised learning of tracking, or unsupervised learning of tracking from videos, and that's another ECCB submission. So it's very, very fresh. Um, okay. So uh, let's talk about structure learning first. So everyone know when people will hear the phrase machine learning, most certainly practitioners think of this, basically numerical parameter optimization, um, which is fine. Um, and there's you know, lots of interesting work there on fast optimization methods. But what about the topology of the network? Where does that come from? Well, that's usually designed by hand, but we would like to automatically discover a good structure as well. So how can we do that? Um, so there's several methods. There's this um, class of techniques called neural architecture search. This phrase was created by Kwok Lee's team, who is a parallel team in Google Brain. And so what they do is they say, okay, well, we can specify a graph structure by just representing it as a string, a variable length string. And now we can train a generative model to produce strings. Let's use an RNN for that. And then the reward function is I'm gonna generate a string, I'm gonna train up this network, and then I'm gonna evaluate it um, on a validation set, and this reward will then um, be used to update the parameters of the RNN, okay? So it's very expensive, uh, because every evaluation you have to fit a network um, on some data set. So the key is really to um, train it on a, a small data set with small models and hope that it generalizes to big data sets and bigger models. Um, so here's an example from their paper of, um, what they did is they, they said, let's not try to learn the whole network in one shot. Um, because it's just too difficult, the search space is too large. Let's learn what they call a cell, um, which has a, a, a limited number of operations in it, and then let's just replicate that cell. Um, so the structure is repeated, but the parameters are untied. And then you can unroll this as much as you want, depending on how, how much of a model you can afford to, to use. Okay, so um, I got interested in this recently because they showed me this result. Uh, actually. We help them create this result. So we have an object de detection system um, that's been open sourced and it's state of the art, uses faster RCNN and SSD and all of those things. But under the hood, you have to have a base CNN feature extractor. So you can plug in ResNet or Inception or MobileNet or whatever. Um, but uh, what the NAS guys were able to do is learn a structure and by unrolling it variable amounts of time, they can actually sweep out this curve where they can get more and more precision of course, it's costing more and more, but you see it's superior to all of these previous methods. So they were just taking a model trained for classification, sticking it in at the front end of an object detection system, and then fine-tuning the object detection system, and they got wins. So that was pretty intriguing, because it wasn't actually trained for object detection, it was trained on CIFAR classification, which is a pretty different task. Um, well, it's not radically different, but it's not a direct fit. So, um, so this is great. So we'd like to do more of this. We want to make this curve even higher, <laughs> right, improve the gap. But the problem is, so one way to do that might be to search a larger space of models, right? Learn the whole topology of an object detector, not just the, the feature extractor. The problem is this is an extremely expensive search mechanism. And there are other methods that use say, evolutionary algorithms and they're equally expensive. Um, so this is a quote from their paper. So even at Google, this is expensive, right? <laughs> so um, I read this and I thought, this is great. I, I like the outcome, I don't like the means that they got there. So let's try a different approach. Yes? This is the whole thing to find this cell, um, including, I think, I think that includes hyperparameter optimization. But so what they did, so, so this is, um, I don't remember all of the details. They, they find a cell that works well on CIFAR validation without, I think, tweaking hyperparameters, only searching over structures. And then when they have it, then they do an additional find, they unroll it and then they fine tune some more. 
So that's an excellent question, and I'm going to revisit that in a moment. Um, so uh, anyway, so I thought, okay, well this treating it, uh, like searching through the, the space of strings of length 50 seems rather inefficient. So why don't we just initially search the space of short strings and then grow them gradually? Like, so let's do heuristic search, um, a bit like uh, you know, branch and bound, where we're going to start with small models. We're going to evaluate how good they are and use that to rank <coughs> candidate models and then extend them a little bit and then use our prediction function to, s to pick the best and grow those. So we call this progressive neural architecture search. So you start with a fixed number of candidates um, where it's like a depth one circuit. Um, you train, train them all. Um, you fit a proxy function to predict how well they'll do. And you expand, the, um, you expand all possible child nodes. You rank them using your proxy function. You pick the, the top K in your beam, and then you repeat. Okay. So it's a very simple idea, and there certainly have been related approaches. Um, uh, and we, for our proxy function, we currently, so we have to handle a model of variable length, and we have to be able to predict the quality of a model that's bigger than a model that we've seen. So that um, is an important approach. So we use both RNNs and MLPs as our proxy function, um, and that's something I'll address also in, in, in a future slide. Um, anyway, the bottom, so that's it, it's a super simple idea. The bottom line is that we're about five times faster than NAS in terms of the number of models that we have to fit. So this is the speed up curve. If you look at accuracy on uh, validation set as a function of time, random search is, uh, if you say look at the top one, is the dotted red line. So we have to compare to random search. Random search is pretty good, actually. If you look at the, the RL method, NAS, that's the solid red line, and that you know, does beat random search. Um, we can quibble over whether that gain is worth the effort, but that this is this. If you really, really want to squeeze juice out, maybe it is. And then we're the dotted uh, red line here, and you can see we we we're above the RL method by a pretty healthy margin there. So we basically match their performance with five times fewer models. Um, but it's not just the number of models that you have to touch. There's uh, additional things. So um, as uh, as was mentioned in the NAS paper, they pick a model and then they actually, uh, ha I think, have a short list of 250 models at the end of their search, and they train them all even longer, and then they pick the best. It's like a two-stage process. So if you take the total cost into account, we're about 20 times faster um, if you do a fair accounting, and we're about 60 times faster than the recent evolutionary method from another team at Google. Um, and we all get roughly the same performance. Um, the other thing is, um, since we're searching in this progressive way, we're actually spitting out a family of models as we go. So if you want a lightweight model, you can get that even more quickly, right? Because you're searching fewer models. Um, and so this suggests like n automatically searching the Pareto curve where we trade off speed versus accuracy. And uh, this was like on my to-do list and then it turns out someone's already done it. This is an iClear paper or a workshop paper um, where they actually built on our uh, not on our code, but on our algorithm. So they call it, uh, well, they use the progressive, the PNAS algorithm I just described, and they use it to sweep out um, a, a variety of models that trade off error and accuracy or error and size. Um, so that's just a screenshot from their paper. Um, and we're doing this on CIFAR, but of, you know, fortunately, good performance on CIFAR translates to good performance on ImageNet, and we know that good performance on ImageNet translates to good performance on other data sets like Coco, and that in turn results in stuff that works in the, in the wilds for the most part, which is kind of amazing. So we want it to actually work on a variety of data sets. Um, so that's where we are now. Currently, I, I, I said we're using an MLP as our predictor, uh, but since this is really um, uh, a sample impoverished setting because each data point is very expensive, it might be better to use a Bayesian model like, say, a GP, we have to handle a kernel that can handle variable size models, so we could use string kernels, or maybe we could embed the tokens. I was talking with uh, Song, I think just, oh, there you are, uh, about this yesterday. Um, so there's some things to explore. Um, also, we just greedily pick the top K at every step. We could do some of the techniques from the Bayes op literature, um, like um, expected improvement or entropy search or so on. And of course, we can use warm starting. And you know, there are many people working in this space. Many of these ideas have been tried, but um, uh, not necessarily in combination. Okay, so that was part one. Any quick questions on part one? Yes? It seems like you haven't stopped improving because you showed the search. Uh, that one? Yeah. 
Um, so this is um, when, a, that's a very good question. You can, so this is B equals five. So this is, now we're searching models that are as complex as the RL method. Um, we actually did run it longer. We, we just go deeper and deeper. We went up to 10 um, and we do improve, but it kind of plateaus about B equals eight. Um, and we didn't include it because we didn't have a baseline from NAS um, and we thought it was an unfair comparison. So it, it does continue to go up, but then it plateaus. Yes. Uh, what are your other problems? Yes. The, the first question in the other problems? Yes. Are you implicitly assuming that uh, similar, somehow similar structures are implementing similar functions? Yes. So I skipped this. I'm, you have very good eagle eyes. So this, I think, is a very interesting thing. So currently, um, our predictor is, say, it's an RNN, and it's, it's mapping from strings to, to quality, right? But there's aliasing, because there's, you know, there's, ambi there's um, unidentifiability in model space. So this is going to be true if we use GPs with string kernels or whatever, right? So the, the problem is that just specifying the topology is not a very, um, it's not sufficient because the parameters can compensate for a bad topology. So, um, so I have this idea which feels very much like sort of inspired by natural gradients and information geometry. I, I wanted to mention it here because I'm in Tokyo. Um, so if you could fit the parameters of these models, you could look at their predictive performance and use that to measure similarity of two models, but that's really expensive. So I don't, if you have ideas on how to do this quickly, I'd love to talk because um, I think that's the right thing. We want to look at them as functional mappings not in an invariant parameter invariant ways. Even, even similar predictions do not guarantee you having similar functions. They can have different uh, gradients. Yes, true, true. But at least it's looking at it as a, as a yeah. functional map. And then we could look at gradients and then generalization. I think it's a step in the right direction. I just don't know how to do it quickly. Um, so yeah, let's, let's chat. Um, Have you tried this with other things than the C bar? Or I mean, with other types of data? We haven't. Um, we've only done it for images, but the uh, the NAS team did try it for LSTMs, and they were able uh, for some neural language modeling task, and they were able to outperform s standard RNN architectures. You know, the gains are also fairly small. I mean, these are fairly small gains, but if you really want to squeeze out juice, but I actually think th this kind of thing is where the action is. It's not so much getting 0.5 percent gain on a benchmark. It's like automatically sweeping out trade-off curves particularly when you have constraints on your hardware um, and certain topologies just won't run on a, on a TPU because we don't support whatever the operation is. So um, that takes a lot of human time right now and there's no reason we shouldn't automate it. Okay, I wanna move on. Um, so uh, since I did promise to talk about images and text. So, uh, okay, so now we're gonna do unsupervised learning um, and the structure or the network will be known as a graphical model. Um, it's gonna look like this and this is, this decoder is some fixed CNN thing, um, or uh, deconvolutional network actually. So everyone knows about VAEs, I assume. So basically they're doing density estimation, and the hope is that the latent variables will discover something interesting about the world. But what does interesting mean, right? I mean, it's, I might spend all my bits modeling the texture of the floor, and that's not very interesting. So you do need to guide the model um, to uh, give it hints about what you care about. So one way to do that is to have an auxiliary task, let's say it's text generation, and now what you're trying to find is things that are shared between these two modalities. And that feels to me like a more useful thing to do because you're trying to capture commonalities um, and then all of the idiosyncratic things like the texture of the floor can be buried in the stochasticity of this local node. And now Z has relieved the pressure of having to model that low level stuff and will focus its efforts on modeling things that are shared between the image and the high-level description that the human might give. Okay, um, so obviously, you know, many people have looked at joint VAEs. Um, this is a straightforward extension of the standard approach. Um, one thing uh, what's, which is nice about these generative models is that you can use them for semi-supervised learning, as was mentioned yesterday. So obviously you can have XY pairs, image and text pairs, but you can also train just on images and just on text. Um, so what we do in this work is, is a slight twist. Um, we, uh, we always have both images and, and, and labels, but we don't always see all of the labels. So I've shown this as like a half, uh, half ellipse here. Um, so you see some of the, in, in here you see the right labels, and here you see the left labels, and here you see all the labels. Okay, so it's a slightly different version of 
it's going to be supervised. Okay, so, and we're going to assume all of these labels um, uh, and attributes are conditionally independent. Um, so we're going to see a subset of these. Okay, so why do we want to do that? So the nice thing about attribute vectors is that by specifying subsets of attributes, you can induce what I call compositional concept hierarchies. Um, and there's actually a, um, there's a DeepMind paper that does something similar. Where's Tom? Um, I don't remember her name. Um, Irina, uh, Irina Higgins et al. have something very similar also at iClear this year. So imagine now that we have faces and we have attributes describing those faces. If I don't specify any of the bits in the attribute, I'm basi basically saying I want to generate all possible faces. And then I could say, I could specify the gender bit to be, say, male, but leave everything else unspecified. And then I'm going to generate men with glasses and with beards and without and so on. Um, or I could clamp a different bit, right? So by specifying subsets of the bits, I define concepts at different levels of granularity. And if I specify all of the bits, I have a fully specified problem. Um, and there's still, of course, variation within this class. You know, there are many men with glasses, right? So I expect to see some variation, but there's much less variation in this leaf node than there is in these interior nodes. And of course, this is a very entropic state, right? This is all possible faces. Um, so basically, I, the, the analogy is like, I think of these as like playing chords on a, on a keyboard, right? And you can specify constraints on the, on the model uh, on, on how you want it to generate. So, um, so the difference from standard conditional generative models is there you condition on a fixed vector and everything's always known. And here, we're clamping different um, subsets of the, of the bits. So uh, I think I went over this. It's just a cartoon illust illustration. Okay, so we want to fit this model to data. Um, so we're going to do the usual amortized inference thing, fit some inference networks that can handle both paired images and text. At test time, we just want to give it an image and uh, maybe predict the text, or we just give it <coughs> text and predict the image. So we have to handle unimodal inference. We'll train these three inference networks simultaneously. Um, but the the the... the uh, one of the twists is that we have to handle missing attributes, right? Because I might only train on an image that's labeled as a male face and I don't know all of the other attributes. Or it's certainly at test time, I want to be at a um, condition on partially specified abstract concepts. So the way we do that is that we assume that the inference network has this uh, product of experts form. And why do we do that? Well, it turns out in the, conveniently, <laughs> we actually did it because it just seemed like the right thing to do. So the, the intuition is that um, each attribute gives you a constraint, and so if I just observe one attribute, I get a broad Gaussian. If I get a different attribute, I get a Gaussian in a different subset of the latent dimensions, and I multiply them together. I'm uh, narrowing down where in latent space I'm referring to, and so that's analogous to the product of experts model. It turns out that in the linear Gaussian setting, this is actually exactly the optimal answer. This is how you do inference with missing data. It turns out to be a product of experts. Um, as Chris Williams recently pointed out to me in their archive paper. So this is sort of a nonlinear extension of that. Um, we can train it using elbow, and we're training three inference networks simultaneously, um, but it's the straightforward thing to do. Okay, so we, we fit it to data, um, and so what data are we going to use? So we have a version of MNIST that we call MNIST with attributes, <laughs> where you take MNIST digits and you, you tile them in a larger uh, canvas, and then you specify um, the, an attribute vector with four attributes that controls where they are and what orientation and so on. And then we use the standard celeb A um, with a subset of the attributes which are less ambiguous than the full set of 40. Okay. Um, all right, so we fit it on those data sets uh, using uh, min maximizing the elbow and then we apply it to data. And so let's, how are we gonna, let's look at some pictures and then let's evaluate it. So if we give it the image and we ask, so we give it X, we infer Z and we ask it to predict Y. That's just standard label prediction. That's kind of boring. It's just standard cl multi-label classification. Um, the night, it's easy to evaluate, right? You just ask, the, were the labels cor correctly predicted? Um, a more interesting thing you can do is, um, is, if you're given a set of images, you could ask, well, what do they all have in common? Um, so now the input is, so if I give you these, this set of images, then what you'd like to do is say, well, um, all of these are, um, big digits, they're all upright and they're all in the bottom left, right? Um, whereas these guys here, um, these all, you, what they all have in common is that they're all sixes, 
um, but they're all over the place. They're different sizes and different locations. So you want to find like the most specific node in that concept hierarchy that explains the data. And um, we have a heuristic way of doing that that leverages our inference networks that I'll, that I'll skip. Um, but we can compare that to some uh, other ways of fitting these joint VAEs. So ours is the triple elbow. There's the joint multimodal variational autoencoder and by VCCA. Um, and we work, we're, sl we're slightly better, we're much better than by VCCA and slightly better than JMVAE. Um, but more interesting is the opposite, right? So that's from image to text, um, or attributes, I should say. Now let's do the opposite. So if I tell you um, some attributes like bottom left and I say, please generate me some images, then it generates, this is a random set of six samples. So these are all digits and they're all in the bottom left, but the class is varying, which is what we want, right? And the rotate orientation is varying because I didn't tell you what class and what orientation. Um, and so by specifying different subsets of the bits, you can induce a distribution that has variable entropy. Um, and so how are we gonna measure this? So in unsupervised image modeling, people use the inception score, which is basically saying, um, generate me a diversity of images that, which if I were to classify them, it would be uncertain about the labels. Um, so they have to look realistic enough that you're gonna fool the classifier basically, but you don't really care what the class is. So we're doing conditional density estimation. We're, we're specifying the bits. So what we wanna do is be diverse but we want every image that you generate to match the constraint that you specified. Um, so what we do is we define this new criterion, um, which we apply to evaluate our model, but it could be used for any conditional generative model. So um, we call these criteria the three Cs. <laughs> so correctness is the first C, which means if I specify um, that I want male faces with glasses, then every image that's generated should trigger the male classifier and the glasses classifier. So we pre-train all these classifiers on infinite data. So that's like an oracle. Um, and um, that's telling us that the data we're generating is consistent with Y. But for the bits that we didn't specify, we wanna be maximally diverse. So we can look at all the other attributes. So whether you have a beard or not, or whether your hair is black or brown. Um, and then we, don't, we wanna be maximum entropy over those. And then the third thing is we want to be compositional. So if I train on, the, oh, here's an example. If I train on um, big digits on the left and small digits on the right, then I should be able to test on small digits on the left and big digits on the right, right? So combinations that I haven't seen before. It's a strong generalization, basically. So um, anyway, so we define these criteria and then we compare three different methods and we look at the generated images where we specify queries at different levels of granularity. So these are the four bits are specified to so the concrete, uh, three bits, two bits, or one bit is the most vague, and uh, we're better than other methods. Okay, so uh, it's more interesting to look at pictures. So if I um, specify a query like generate me something big in the bottom left, then um, these are the samples. This one isn't quite correct. It's not the bottom left, but other than that, it looks fine. If I add another bit, I clamp another key on the keyboard, I say I want them all to be eights, the mostly all eights, this is uh, not correct, but other than that, it's fine. Um, and they have to be realistic enough to trigger this classifier, right? But we don't use that during training on like a GAN, that's just for eval. And then I say I want them all to be counterclockwise and they're mostly counterclockwise. So it's sort of responding in the way that we want it to respond, right? It's a controllable generation process. And then we can do it on faces, so, um, if we just say make me faces, then these are some samples from the model, um, which look pretty good. If I say make me um, hair faces with black hair and they're not smiling, um, we get a diversity of, of genders. And uh, so, well, there's not much pose variation in this data set. And I can say I only want women, and then all the faces look female, um, and, and so on and so forth. So it works pretty well. Um, yeah, let's see. Five minutes. Yes, question. Uh, actually, in the um, set about the image generation, the attributes of uh, images are unbalanced. Some com some attributes are very complex and uh, very hard to learn. And uh, I saw that you used eighteen. You selected the eighteen uh, attributes from top from from them, and uh, I I wonder how would you, how do you select the attributes for the training? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we make this naive Bayes assumption that the attributes are independent, which isn't true for Celeb A um, because they're correlated. So we, um, fortunately, there's another paper that had already cherry-picked a subset of 18 that were fairly decorrelated and also fairly unambiguous. They had, I think, the, I don't remember the criteria. I think it was like high inter-rater agreement on what the values were. So we used those. And then we just assume that the condition independent given Z. But it, it, it is a good point. So attribute vectors is obviously really impoverished. We'd like to have natural language sentences. Um, uh, and that's future work. Any other questions or comment? Yeah. So the image generation is very I arbitrarily give you some patch of image that I want you to generate the rest. Can I do with this type of thing? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a VAE, right? I, so, oh, oh, I shouldn't say. Ah, ah. I'm giving you a random patch in the image and then ask if you are the remaining type. Right. Excellent question. So uh, let's go here. So we, so an often under-realized assumption of amortized inference is that you're training an in a discriminative network to do posterior inference. So it's con trained to condition on a fixed length vector that's fully visible, right? So here we do this trick because the, we treat the attributes as independent. We do this product of experts thing for images that won't work, right? So. Um, uh, I don't know the right thing to do. I mean, you could train it with, you could train it just to work on average by masking out image patches, and people have done that. So you're f you know, putting holes in the image and you force it to be entropic um, in the posterior, and it will learn to um, be robust to miss, you don't want to be robust, but you want to be, ideally what you'd want by analogy is if, if I hide most of the pixels, I, I should have a high posterior on Z, right? And if I reveal those pixels, my uncertainty should go down. Um, because you basically, I mean, when you see every pixel, basically it goes to a delta function, right? Um, so uh, we didn't try that on the image side. It's more difficult because there's no obvious structure, yeah. but it's an excellent point. Of course, if you do MCMC or, or, or you don't even do it, or you do variational inference but unamortized, good old school uh, uh, optimization based, you don't have that problem yeah. because it's a generative model. So you could, of course, just use your inference network to initialize an iterative optimizer. So that, that's probably the easiest thing to do. Um, and you hope that your uh, bottom-up guess didn't put you in the wrong basin of attraction. But if sigma is already too small, the optimizer is probably not going to inflate it. So I'm I'm out of time. I um, I don't think I have time to go over the last topic. I'm just going to show you a video, and I'm not going to explain how it works. And then you can ask me. Um, uh, this is just it's so cool. I have to show it. Uh, nope. Okay. Anonymous. I hope there's no ECCV reviewers in the audience. All right. So what we do is we um, train a model to predict, uh, to map from grayscale to color, and as a side effect, it magically learns to uh, track objects. <laughs> and you can ask me about lunch if you want to know why. And it can not just propagate segmentation masks, you can propagate um, key point poses, and is learning an embedding space where uh, similar objects that uh, have similar colors also get embedded close. And of course, you can colorize videos as a side effect. And what's interesting is that when it does a bad job colorizing, it also does a bad job at tracking. Um, so it's a very interesting proxy task. It hasn't been done for video before. So ask me over lunch if you want to know uh, how that works, because that's not on archive yet. <laughs> the other two are on archive. So we have some, yeah. All right, then let's have that. Okay.